Axel, what's going on? Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. No, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, I was glad that you reached out because I, 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 I've seen your work. I, I've read a little bit of your book. I haven't got through the whole thing, but this is a constant <laughs> pain point for me. The, uh, the ignorance, the ignorance around economics, uh, the ignorance around how money works, how value is driven, who gets to determine value. And I was, I was going through your book and going through your work. I'm like, okay, finally, here, here's an individual who gets it and can explain it in a way that is easy for us to understand and consume if we didn't spend any amount of time in the financial industry like I have in the past. So your work is invaluable. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I wrote this book, uh, you know, with the aim of uh, having accessible material for for people uh, so that they can understand basic economic principles. And um, that's because I've seen in Latin America how populism and socialism uh, feeds from this ignorance. People don't understand really basic uh, economic ideas, like what are prices, for example, how, how do they form, uh, what is capital, how is capital created, and so on. So I, I uh, wrote this book, 15 Lessons. Uh, it's called The Street Economist, with 15 Lessons in Economics. Everyone should know. It's a very short book. It, it has no uh, footnotes, and it has no you know math or graphs or anything like that. So it's very easy to understand and it has been a huge success in many, many countries. Yeah. The only thing that would have been better for me if there were more pictures, but outside of that, this is my speed and it's all, like I said, so easy to understand. Yeah. But you know, it has been very popular among the youth, which is really important to me because if you see surveys, polls, like even in the United States, socialism is uh, becoming more and more popular among Gen Zers and, you know, uh, people who are at school or university or universities, not only in the United States, but also in Latin America or in, in Europe. So uh, now it's being published in, in different European countries, even in Germany. It has been a huge success in Germany, uh, but also in different Latin American countries and Spain and so on. So um, I think the aim of the book, which was to make it easy for people to understand uh, economics, has been achieved. And, you know, it's from all social classes. It's very interesting because it's not elitist guys coming from out, out from the university wanted to understand economics it's it's the taxi driver you know it's the uh, you know the delivery guy everyone i mean from different uh, social um, circumstances they are reading the book and and that's makes that makes me very happy and it right. has been a huge best selling book uh, how, let's let's talk about socialism L let's define that term first before we get into the weeds and the nitty gritty yeah. of what that means and what it looks like and why it has become increasingly popular among uh, younger generations, uh, the way I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that socialism is basically, uh, in a way, that the the control over the means by, by which uh, products and goods and services are produced and then distributed through a, a government entity uh, based on people's needs, not necessarily the meritocracy that we somewhat live in right now. Yeah, so um, socialism... In economic terms, uh, this is a classic definition is the uh, control by the state over the means of production, right? Um, but now I would I would suggest something a little bit different. It's um, And it has more to do with philosophy than merely with economics. It has a lot to do with economics, but it's, it's, it's really the, it's a collectivist mindset. It's the idea that individualism is wrong, that pursuing your own happiness uh, and trying to help others, uh, you know, in voluntary arrangements, it's, it's a problem. And therefore, you have to uh, collectivize uh, property and you have to collectivize more and more the fruits of people's labors, uh, labor. And so socialism today means a lot of government redistribution, a lot of government intervention, and um, so the, the the product of your labor is socialized, basically, because if you are paying taxes, as you are paying in Europe, sometimes you're paying 60, 70 percent of your income in taxes. If you add everything, put everything together, then really you are not working for yourself or your family. You're working for the government and they spend the money as they see fit. So um, I, I would I would suggest that socialism nowadays there are not many people who really propose the Soviet Union style of economic system. They, they, what they want is to confiscate what uh, private individuals can create 
And in some cases like Latin America, you have, you know, uh, a more straightforward brand of socialism, which is government taking over crucial companies like mining, the mining sector, uh, like natural resources and, and things like that. It's what you have in Venezuela, for instance, right? Um, so, and, and then you have the whole progressive part with, with, with the deconstruction and the woke movement. And, and that is also mixed with this anti-capitalist mindset um, which is very antithetical to all the ideals that was uh, that were very, uh, I mean, that were foundational to the United States, for example. So that's that's what um, what I would say socialism is today, um, a little bit different from the classic version, right? It's it's interesting that you're talking about that that um, that collectivist mindset because on one hand you're talking about it with this growth of socialism, but on the other hand, if there's really a pervasive idea in in the United States and I'm sure across much of the Western world that it's all about the idolization of self. So you have people saying, you know, they're uh, like trans the transgender movement. I think is a great example yeah. of that. It, we're no longer going to fit into these clearly identified biological uh, windows or, or labels, as they like to say. And instead, we're going to say that I feel this way, therefore I am. And it's become an idolization of self rather than uh, the, the collective agreement or understanding of, in this case, how biology works. So on one hand, in this idea of socialism, you have this idea that uh, it's not about self, but then but then societally, it, it really has become about self and all the institutions of the Western world are being systematically and 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 painfully dismantled. I, I I fully agree, but you know the main difference is we classical liberals or conservatives, we 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 believe in the individual. Even some social democrats like Bill Maher, for instance, right? They they are not mm -hmm. so much to the woke thing. But we believe in the individual as a as a reality. What does it mean that we believe that there is a truth? And and part of that truth is that we exist as individuals. That means we have concrete circumstances, like you are male or female, and we believe in reason. That means uh, we can use arguments based in logic and evidence in order to make our case. And we believe in fundamental rights, like liberty and, and life and all of that, right? And uh, the problem with the woke movement, and we have to remember this, is that it is um, an offspring of neo-Marxist ideologies, uh, like the French postmodern tradition and the Frankfurt School in Germany. And so the uh, main idea within the woke movement is that the tr that truth doesn't exist. Everything is about power. So it's it's narratives competing in order to dominate um, the, uh, certain groups like white heterosexual heterosexual stri straight men. I mean, of course, straight men um, create narratives that would marginalize all other groups. And therefore, if for instance you say. Shakespeare was a great writer, what you are saying is um, that you are um, marginalizing all other writers who are not a white, straight, upper class, uh, Western civilization type of uh, white men, right? And so um, the, the problem with the woke movement is because they don't have an idea of objective truth, it's all about your own feelings and nothing else. And 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 they destroy the individual as a practical reality. They they uh, deny that the individual does exist in the sense that uh, there is some reality beyond your feelings, your perceptions, or the ideas you have in your mind. And that relativism it's core to every totalitarian ideology. If you go to Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia, it was exactly the same. And that was uh, one of Karl Popper's, the great philosopher of, of science in the 20th century. He criticized these ideologies for being relativistic in nature. And they deny the existence, of, the existence of truth in order to impose the truth that they want and that serve uh, their interest and their, um, you know, um, uh, their aim of um, having more and more power in their own hands. And so it's a, uh, it's a very... Um, um, you know, deep a debate that you can have about these issues because they have they have a long history in 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 philosophy, and unfortunately, 
you are seeing now the the West going down the drain because of these uh, relativistic ideologies are uh, taking over all the institutions. And that's why you can't claim that the West is better than other civilizations. You can't claim that there are um, intrinsically positive things about the West. And you cannot claim that there is any sort of hierarchy or superiority about anything because all that there is is power structures and narratives and um, and that have been created by the white guys in order to oppress everyone else. And, and you only can sustain that if you deny the existence of truth, because if you admit that there is truth, then you have to accept that some things are better than others because you have an objective standard in order to measure if something is better than the other thing, right? And if some right. cultures are better than others, and if some ideas are better and, and so on and so forth. So, so that I would say is the main difference between um, between what we argue individual, I mean, what we classical liberals defend as an individual and what they argue is an individual. They, they the, as, as I said, they deny the existence of the individual and go to a point where it's a mere creation of their imagination, like like a, you know, um, like they were in the Matrix or something like that. It's it's not really um, a serious philosophy, but it's very contagious. the the power The power dynamics is a really interesting argument. Uh, for example, someone listening to this podcast might might conclude if they fall under this ideology that I have some level of power because. I have access to this podcast or access to guests like yourself, or I'm somewhat influential with the people who would listen. And I'm on a micro scale compared to other companies and organizations out there, but I'm just using this as an example. But what's interesting about it is that if I let that so-called power go to my head, uh, or I start losing my ability to add value, and that's one of the concepts you talk about in your book is who determines value, if I understand correctly. So if I yeah. lose perceive value in the eye of the consumer, that so-called power that I had goes away. I, I'm no longer as influential as I once was. So the power is not really there. The power is with the 8 billion people collectively uh, on the planet deciding what is valuable and what they're willing to trade or pay for goods and services. But I'm always fascinated with individuals who buy into this power hierarchy and in order to replace the power dynamics and structures they believe exist, they're willing to trade it to an all-powerful, all-benevolent uh, government that has proven throughout time and history to squash and trample individuals way quicker and with much more brutality than any organization or corporate company on the planet. I don't understand why it's okay that the government does it because they're, you know, benevolent. Yeah, you know, Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, used to used to speak about this, and he he defined this worldview as uh, statolatry, right? It's a sort of religion that um, that you embrace and makes you believe that the government, the state, is going to somehow solve all problems and it's going to. You know, elevate society to higher degrees of moral uh, standing and, and economic prosperity, which is of, of course nonsense because there is no such thing as government or state. The state. There are groups of people who have certain privileges in the monopoly of violence. That's what we call the state and politicians, and they have their own agendas and their own, and they also pursue their own interests, but with our money. And then we have the uh, regular citizens who have to pay taxes in order to support all of that. And, uh, and and fund all of these people. And, um, and and this is one of the things I explain in the book. Uh, value is is created by the entrepreneurs and you know business people only in so far as they are um, satisfying demands and needs from the consumers and the regular people. I mean there is there is zero chance that you can become rich in a capitalist society or the free market if you don't, <laughs> come up with some idea that people value because no one is going to buy it. Uh, and, and so you will go broke. Uh, and you have every day uh, thousands of companies that are going broke, you know, from large corporations to small um, enterprises. And so it's, it's a big misconception to think that, for instance, even your income is determined by the generosity of your employer. That's not the case. 
and there is no power. Bill Gates has no power over us because he's much wealthier than we are. I mean, and, and, and astronomically wealthier than we are. So why not? Because we, we have something called uh, human capital, right? If, if Bill Gates came to you and told you, okay, now you work for me for $500 per month, you would say, no chance. I will, I will not do that because, I mean, I have alternatives, right? In the free market, I can go and make 10000 20000 a month, whatever. And, um, and so B Bill Gates has no power over you. He, he will have to go to the MIT engineers and pay what they are demanding in the market. Uh, even though he is much wealthier. So this idea that wealthy people have power because they have money, it's a complete misconception. And, uh, and the only way they can have real power is by colluding with the politicians, because then they have the compulsory apparatus of the state that can make you know laws that benefit, uh, benefit them and, and give them privileges and all sorts of subsidies. And that's when you have crony capitalism, which is the opposite to free market capitalism. And, and well, I think that's what people conflate, right? They say, well, capitalism yeah. is bad. It's like, well, tell me what about capitalism is wrong. And they'll explain crony capitalism. I'm like, I, I agree. That is horrible. Yeah. You know, whether it's big pharma or e e we even see this in, in tech spaces and social media spaces with uh, all sorts of revelations showing that uh, the, the Department of Justice and other departments within the federal government uh, have, have colluded with big tech companies to suppress certain platforms, yes. certain thoughts and concepts that has nothing to do with capitalism. That's crony capitalism. And that's actually what we're suggesting people want more of. That's a confusing concept to me. Yeah, but that's exactly, you know, that happens because people really don't know a lot about economics. And that's why I wrote the books, the book, uh, The Street Economist, because if people understood like how prices work, how productivity is determined, what is capital and things like that, they would never um endorse this worldview that the government is the solution for our problems and and that you know uh, capitalism is the same as chronic capitalism a free market system is by definition free you have some rules like private property and others and then you have to compete and you have to compete in order to collaborate with your consumers which is another myth that you know that the system is cruel because you are only competing and then uh it's so inhuman and so on no, a free market is a system where people compete. Yes, companies compete, but in order to, to collaborate with the consumers, you have Toyota competing, you know, with Mazda or Subaru or whatever. But uh, in order for you to have a better car that is cheaper, right? Or now Tesla with other uh, uh, companies uh, making uh, electric vehicles. So, um, so it's it's the best system that has ever uh, existed, and we are corrupting it more and more with huge government spending, with huge government interventions everywhere. And the United States, unfortunately, is not an example. And, and, and I see many resemblances to what's going on in Latin America. I mean, I'm very worried about the United States. If they don't, if they don't go back to their free market, um, if you want, Jeffersonian type of uh, ideas, um, with small government, no? Uh, he, he Jefferson uh, was bragging about the fact that he had he had shrunk the government when he was a president, and at the time the government was minimal; it didn't exist practically, and he was pretty much against the idea of expanding the powers of government. And now you have this ideology proposing that the government has to intervene everywhere, and on top of that you have the woke movement, which is a sort of totalitarian ideology that is you know corrupting everything from the humanities which are completely lost i would say to uh hard sciences you can't you can't even do physics now without having concern for diversity in your team if the results will offend or not certain groups and so on and so forth this is insane what's going on it's it's really the decline of the west and i'm very worried about this we see uh one of the most recent things I think to your point in the news is this uh, frivolous lawsuit against, uh, I believe it's against SpaceX because uh, SpaceX has not uh, hired enough uh, asylum seekers or, you know, foreign nationals. And so now SpaceX is being sued and it's no longer about, it's no longer about the product, the, the rockets and the propulsion and the innovation and the adaptation that you talk about in the book. And now it's more, well, what does your workforce look like? And that has nothing to do necessarily 
with creating a better product that's going to get us to the moon or space exploration or Mars or even advancements in technology that we as consumers will use in our everyday lives. Absolutely. You know, the problem is that, you know, the United States is it's a nation that was founded on the idea of moral equality. That means that everyone, all men are created equal, basically. That means we have the same rights. Yeah. And and so the uh, natural outcome of that is institutional institutional arrangements uh, that guarantee equality before the law, equal treatment, right? But the problem is that in order to have a free society, you need to believe that the important unit is the individual and not collective groups. Like, um, so you are an individual with your own um, character and I judge you, but I, I can judge you by the content of your character and your actions. But the woke movement, what, what has um, achieved is to convince many people that the important um, thing is that, I mean, the color of your skin, your genitalia, uh, your, your whatever, you know, your um, sexual orientation, all of those things. And why did they do that? Because they, they have fallen into what is called identity politics. The politics of identity means that you uh, create certain groups that have contingent um, qualities like the color of the skin, uh, sexual orientations, what I, what, I, what I just explained, and you conceive them as being in existential opposition with other groups. So straights against uh, gays and then white people against all the rest and so on. And when you have this worldview institutionalized you cannot have equality before the law and so spacex can't really hire people anymore based on their qualifications and their merits because that would assume that you are evaluating people for their um, abilities and not for the color of their skin their social condition their background and so on and that's incompatible with the expectations of an identitarian sort of a mindset which would tell you, you need to have women, you need to have black people, you need to have uh, Latinos and so on. And, and, and it's a never ending story because you can always go uh, further you know, uh, down the road and say, why don't you have overweighted people in your, in your, in your team? And, and then all institutions become politicized and then they don't serve the purpose that they, are, they have been created to uh, for, which is uh, in the case of SpaceX, you know, to get to Mars or whatever, they they become tools for a uh, power agenda, which is promoted by the left, um, and it has to do with um, the this forced diversity, forced inclusion, which is everything but real diversity and real inclusion, because they celebrate the color of your skin as long as you don't vote for Trump, right? I mean, uh, if if you think differently from everyone else then you are also not invited, despite the fact that you are a black or Latino or something like, like you know, a minority. And, um, and so diversity is okay as long as everyone thinks the same. And, and you see that in universities, you see that everywhere. And that's why I, I claim that the West is in decline, because everything from sports to mu classical music and companies has become politicized and uh, it, they have been corrupted. By this agenda that's what i was saying right yeah. if you have if you have a laboratory in at the university in, in harvard let's say at harvard and you don't have enough women like you have a problem they're not giving you the funds they're not giving you money for research because now that's a requirement if you want to get funds uh, but what makes you think that because you have more diversity in your lab in terms of of uh, you know biological diversity, gender, for example, right? Gender, that would make it a better place to discover anything. Like like, is it cells are going to reveal themselves? Uh, you know, easy. <laughs> to have two women and one guy looking at them. I don't think so. So this is complete nonsense. Uh, but is is having is having disastrous effect all over, all over the institutions, public and private institutions. Well, I mean, part of it is just speaking out of both sides of your mouth. What, what do they call it? 1984, uh, uh, double speak, right? It's like you think about yeah, you think, speak. what is it? Ah, you, you speak? Double, double think. Yeah, the, the uh, double, yeah, the, like Orwell with the 
having two contradictory ideas of the, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a double yeah, thing. So, he, so here's one right here. You, you mentioned it yourself. Uh, having having enough women, for example, at a, at a university in order to secure grants. Well, the same people that would say you need more women can't even tell me what a woman is. They can exactly. say that one person can defi define themselves as a woman one day and the next day define themselves as a, you know, a, a, a pansexual kangaroo or something. It's like, well... How are you going to tell me you need more women, but you can't even tell me what an actual woman is like that's speaking out of both sides of your mouth. And, uh, you know, at this point, I can't help but think it's only one of three things. It's either ignorance, just being dumb or being malicious. And, and I don't know that we can do anything about being dumb or malicious. Uh, ignorance, sure, we can educate. But outside of that, it has me very concerned. You've, you've mentioned multiple times that you're concerned for the future of the West, specifically the United States. What does this look like in your mind if we continue down uh, with, our, with our identity politics and with our uh, economic catastrophes? What does this actually look like in reality if we continue down this path? I wouldn't rule out in the future if, if this continues a civil war in the United States because... You know, the last time in the U.S., I mean, you, you had this um, this fight for the soul of the nation was in the American Civil War, which was really the idea that, you know, slavery was incompatible with the promises made by the founding fathers. With like, which are, I think most people would agree with. Of course, it's absolutely true. There's yes. no question about that. But now you have this um, totalitarian left um, woke people telling you that the the idea of equality before the law, which is, you know, what the civil war was about, it was equality before the law, equality for everyone, um, is racist in itself, in its essence. It's a part of the narrative and the power structure created by white men in order to marginalize the rest. And how do they uh, demonstrate this well they tell you look at the numbers of african americans who are you know um not uh, i mean being being very uh left behind i mean they are, who are being left behind or or so and they tell you that's because of systemic racism and how do you fix systemic racism which is baked into the constitution in into the traditional institutions in the united states well, you have to you have to make a revolution. That's basically what you have to do. You have to get away with the American Constitution. You have to get away with the idea of equality before the law. You have to start introducing all of these, uh, of course, affirmative actions, which are already old in in the United States. That's that's not recent thing. But now you are having universities that are you know dropping uh, the GREs or uh, you know standardized tests in order to have more inclusion, and then you have people fighting each other. You had the Asian American community suing Harvard because they are being discriminated massively against in order to favor Latinos and black people. This is a disgrace. This is not the spirit of the United States. So I can easily imagine that if everything becomes politicized at some point, people will want to have their country back and, 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 and others will want to destroy it. Yeah, on the left, and and that's really dangerous to me. If 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 there is not if the if the Democratic Party does not react against this woke nonsense and starts becoming more reasonable, then I believe that uh, the reaction will be also much more aggressive, and at some point you will have a, a national crisis, and, and that's the worst the worst scenario that you can. It's a nightmare, basically. Yeah, well, of course, you know, millions of people will die if that's the case. Uh, it's, I've thought about that with regards to civil war, and I think some of the cases against it are, you know, what does what does that even look like geographically? You take the the, the civil war, uh, and it it was essentially drawn north versus south, right? But that 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 doesn't take place today. That's different. I mean, my my neighbor, you know, could could be. Uh, a leftist and I could be ultra conservative uh, or, or vice versa. And so we're so intermingled and intertwined that I don't think there's a, a clearly defined geographical line where that civil war takes place, which has me wondering, I don't know that you're wrong. I just wonder what that actually would look like because of how mixed we are geographically. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure 
But uh, if you take a look at the voting records in the United States, you can see that Democrats are winning in the uh, in the coasts, basically, and uh, true, yeah, cities, and, and all the rest is is basically red. So there is a huge divide between the elites and the ur uh, urban type of population and the rest of the of the uh, American citizens, and uh, and and it's so the mindset is so different that you can have someone like Hillary saying these people are all deplorables, right? And then mm -hmm. you have the arrogance of the ghosts, elites, um, telling them that they're all racists and xenophobes and this and that. And of course, that's not that's not really helping. And then you have, for instance, someone who, who has uh, studied this in, in great detail, which is the sociologist um, Charles Murray. He wrote this book, Coming Apart, and and you can see that in the United States you have now um, uh, a huge divide that had never happened before in terms of social classes, in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, values, in terms of everything. And so um, even, even in terms of politics, people are trying to move to places where they don't find people who think differently anymore. I mean, of course you have everywhere Republicans and Democrats and that's that's for sure. But if you take a look at the large numbers, I know many people who have left uh, California because they don't like the politics of the place and they don't like to be surrounded by these uh, inquisitors who are, you know, trying to, to cancel you all the time. Uh, and I'm sure there are millions of cases like that um, if I had if I had to move to the United States and I I'm in the process of probably doing so, I would move to Florida where I'm right now because I, I can't really express my free opinion if I was living in New York among the elites there or in or in California in LA or something like unless I'm in a very close circle of friends. And so um this totalitarian mindset of the woke movement, I think, of course, is creating a reaction against it, which is also strong. And it will make it more difficult to to be to to live together. And, and and I've seen this idea. I don't remember which politician proposed it, but like let's 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 end the union and have Democrats living in some states and Republicans living in other states. It's happening. It's happening naturally, I think. And the question is, can you can you sustain the union in the long run if you have such divisions? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's possible at the rate that we're going. You know, we've talked a lot about different political ideologies that fall outside of the scope of economics, but you chose to write, write this book and you study a lot on economics, especially these 15 principles that people can apply is is part of the reason and I don't want to to lead you at all but I'm wondering if if part of the reason is because this is the entry point to helping people understand and then it permeates other facets of our lives or is it yes. just a small piece of the puzzle that's separate from other areas that we also need to address I think I think it's a it's a crucial um part of the battle against tyranny and against um ever growing governments because I am absolutely convinced that economic, uh, you know, illiteracy is the main reason why people, or one of the main reasons why people tend to support big uh, government politicians and populists and socialists and demagogues. And um, are you and saying so because those individuals, you said economic literacy, but illiteracy, some yeah, of, it's, well, some of the wealthiest people on the planet. Yeah support these insane ideologies so i'm i'm not sure if it's economic literacy and and we can't forget that socialism was invented by the elites just like communism and uh, well communism and socialism is it's more or less the same and fascism uh yeah i mean that's that's true and that deserves deserves an explanation but i think it has to do with the fact that many wealthy people and i know some do not necessarily understand economics no no like if you ride a bike that doesn't mean that you know the physical laws that enables you enable you to ride the bike so many people have made a lot of money and some feel guilty because they have a lot of money and so they start supporting 
uh, BLM or other NGOs that promote really um, very, very toxic ideologies. And, and so that's like part of virtue the, signaling. Uh, virtue response. Signal, it, it, it has to do a lot with virtue signaling. And, and it, this is the classic case with Hollywood stars who are communists and Marxists and live in their $30 million LA mansions, you know, which is a complete hypocritical thing to do and uh, that they speak about inequality and 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 they support people like Chavez you know Oliver Stone supporting Chavez and so uh, it's it's really insane but this is nothing new in history I mean we we had Felix Weil who was a, a very rich German guy who who started the Institut für Sozialwissenschaft in Germany which it was basically created in order to transform Germany in the 1920s into a Marxist communist state. And that's the, the epicenter for many of the ideas that you have right now in the United States, because also a lot of these thinkers like Herbert Marcuse and uh, Theodor Adorno and Horkheimer and others came to the United States. When the Nazis came to power, they, they fled to the United States and brought their ideas with them. And, and, and so this is, the, this is critical theory. This comes from the Frankfurt School and is this cultural Marxism basically that took over universities a year later, and also with the help of the French thinkers like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida. And this, uh, my point is that these people were funded by very wealthy George Soros type of tycoons, right? And, and, and one could ask uh, oneself, why is George Soros funding so many destructive initiatives? And, and, and in his case, I don't think it's ignorance. In his case, I think he's really much a person who hates the West. That's that's and my. It's malicious, sure. It's malicious. I think it's evil, right? And that that does exist. I mean, if you study the history of communism, it, it was evil. It was really, truly evil, and many people, uh, you know, fell for for this thing, and um, and they endorsed it and they supported it, and many rich people did that. Even 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 people from from the Catholic Church and others. Our Pope, the Pope that we have now, the Catholic Church. He's a he's a communist. I mean, he's socialist. He said. That the true Christians were the communists. He actually said that, and, and so um, I mean, you you have these ideologies, these worldviews, these religions that can really uh, ruin everything. And then it doesn't matter if you are wealthy or not. People will wanna. You will have people from all social conditions that uh, will want to endorse these things. And also, as you said, because of virtue signaling, it's it's really convenient. So you can you don't get your privileges examined very, um, you know, carefully uh, by the woke uh, mob uh, to endorse some woke causes and say, oh, I care so much about diversity. Or you have, you know, Ma uh, Megan Fox having all the all her children being trans. I mean, what are the odds? Three children and the three of them mm -hmm. are trans. I mean, this is this is pure virtual signaling. This is pure. I'm I'm so cool. Yeah, I, I go with this uh, uh, trend, and 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 I'm I'm better than the rest. And this need to to prove that you are morally superior to others, it, it's intoxicating, and, and and enables you to cancel the rest, because you claim you are you are better person, not only, you know, or more famous or wealthier. You are also a better person. That gives you the right to shut uh, everything everything else down, everything uh, everyone else down. So. Yeah, it's it's a very complex situation, and I think uh, if the reaction is not really strong, there is no way that we are going to to save our 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 hemisphere. And and, and the United States is the it's the key battleground. If we lose the U.S., we lose the whole world. Mm. Yeah, I I uh, I think there's also an inherent danger in speaking up and speaking out. You know, there there you will be shunned, you will be doxxed, you will be canceled you will be uh, hurt in, in the wallet sometimes even violently i think about with regards to your comments about transgenderism there's the uh, author abigail schreier with the book uh, irreversible damage you know that like she took so much criticism so much heat and that book has just been blasted for credible work that supported scientifically and and yet it, it, it cannot be tolerated uh, because it goes against these ideologies. Yeah, that's why I say this is a totalitarian movement. We have to be very careful because at the essence of every totalitarian movement, you have um, 
you know, epistemic relativism. That means the idea that there is no objective truth. And, and, and so science doesn't matter anymore because it's not about arguments based on reason and logic and evidence. It's about power. And it's only about that. And, and, and so I, I've read the book. I think it's a great book. And uh, and we have to say these things. I mean, recently, Richard Dawkins, with whom I have, have had you know long conversations a couple of years ago, uh, was also claiming that biological sex is real and that you can be polite and, of course, you know, treat someone who believes who is a woman and being a, a biological male as a woman. You can do that. But what you can't do is to deny the underlying biological the reality. And this, this pretense that there is no objective reality is the problem. Because we could agree that, I mean, let's let's be let's be nice and kind and 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 don't really be aggressive towards people or unpolite, you know, with people who, who believe they are something different. Okay, that's one thing. But it's also your right not to accept it. But but you can we could agree on that, yeah. But what is what is really uh, the problem is that is is this is this uh, claim that there is no objective reality, that everything is a construction of the mind, basically, or, or and the self does not exist because, <laughs> in order for you to create a self, right, you have to exist first. So you cannot create a self ex nihilo for out of nothing. You know what I mean? So, so this this idea is also idiotic because you have to exist as an individual in order to have an identity. You can't have an identity before you are an individual. And if you are an individual, a, a member of a human species, you are uh, you have a head, you have bones, you have cells, and you have chromosomes, chromosomes, right? And you can be male or female. That's it. That's it. There is no other alternative. I mean, there are some cases. Okay, but as a general rule, there are no, no there are no, uh, there are no. Those, other those are those are medical anomalies. Those those yeah, don't medical, that does not represent a, a separate class or gender or sex of an individual. Absolutely, but my point is, you cannot define and say I'm a woman, right? Uh, because because you already exist before you have claimed that you are a woman, and that means. You are a reality that is independent from your thoughts, your uh, your thoughts about yourself, right? I, I I could claim I'm black, but I'm not black, right? I mean, it's the same thing, or that I'm 15 years old and I'm not 15 years old. And actually, this deconstruction, because that's the way that's the word that was used in philosophy in the French philosophy, postmodernist, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, mindset. The deconstruction of the structures leads to chaos. And that's why now you are seeing all this chaos in, in women's sports, for instance. And now are, there are some states and, and countries and organizations that are banning trans men from uh, this uh, female uh, women comp com women's competitions. Because, because, of course, if you allow trans athletes, then you will have chaos within the, uh, the female um, uh, communities it, that, that the athletes athlete communities it, 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 they will not be able to win anything else anymore and then it will collapse because which women will will want to go and compete against biological males right i mean if this becomes a trend a trend no one will want to do that yeah of course and so and so and, and then and then you have men claiming to be babies grown-ups have you seen that no I, I I I don't doubt that, but I haven't seen that. Yeah, they're, they're claiming like 50-year-old men dressed, I mean, with diapers and, and dressed like babies, claiming that they are babies and they perceive themselves, you know, as babies. And now I I, I, I was in Puerto Rico recently giving some, some lectures and I was told that there was a, a, a student, at a, a, it was a schoolboy or girl, I don't remember exactly, but who believed to be... Um, um a cat and she went to school i think it was like 12 years old or 10 dressed with a cat uh type of uh costume 
and the um, and the um, you know the other children were forced into accepting her as a cat. Like imagine the confusion that that creates in your mind as a child, and and the professor, the teacher, the teachers were okay with it. I don't know what the parents were thinking, but uh, well, they weren't. <laughs> It's, they were not thinking, and but I, th I think it's also criminal because you have to or, or uh, you have to give uh, children a uh, clear a clear message and clear standards because they are not capable of doing the sophisticated analysis that we grown-ups can. That's why, for instance, fairy tales have these very clear ideas of good and evil. It's 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 there are no there are no gray areas. It's 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 black and white, right? Because children need that. They are not in a position to, to do this uh, more nuanced approach and to have this, uh, you know. Most which, adults aren't, aren't capable of doing it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's, that's why, and they are also destroying fairy tales. I mean, uh, you know, Snow White now with, with Disney, the, the last uh, production that they are, they are doing right now, it's, it's a complete perversion of the original Grimm's tale. It has nothing to do with the original. And I tell you, I grew up in a German family, so I know about this stuff. Um, and, it, and it's really harming also uh, children because you are depriving them of, of, of a source uh, of knowledge that is very useful for them in order to develop a, sense, uh, a, a strong sense of morality. And fairy tales help you do that. Uh, but if you start woking it up, then 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 you lose it you lose it it's it's it's, right. it's perverted and maybe you achieve well, like, the opposite. I, I think of like fairy you know like hansel and gretel right and it's like you teach a kid don't go with strangers into the forest that's probably a good yeah. principle that kids should know but all of a sudden if if you know the 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 witch is painted as as a victim and you know she's actually a good person but she lures kids into you know because she's a pedophile and that's normalized well that might be an issue for kids to hear that and think that that's acceptable and okay well you know ped pedophilia is actually a big thing and it's coming back into fashion in 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 the i 60s. hate the way you said that i and, and i'm not criticizing you it just the, the way yeah. that the way that that is said is just so it's 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 horrific it's horrific yeah but you know it's a natural result of this woke ideology because if you really believe that there is no objective truth and that all social norms are just uh, forms of discourse that uh, you know have a, the aim of um, exerting uh, oppression by some groups of people over other groups of people. Then the idea that adult, I mean, that sex can only happen between consenting adults, is in itself nothing else than a form of narrative. That is competing against other narratives uh, in order to um, consolidate the um, power of certain type of of people, which are you know straight, white, or not even necessarily white, but straight adults. And so, the pedophiles are being discriminated and oppressed. Uh, you know, if you follow this logic, and and so now you don't call them pedophiles anymore. You call them minor attracted minor person. attracted person. Yep. In order to normalize it, but but and 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 this is really interesting because one of the main philosophers and thinkers that developed this idea, who was Michel Foucault, was himself a pedophile. He would go. He was a French intellectual, very famous uh, in the sixties, seventies, even eighties. He 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 was um, homosexual who who uh, would go to to Africa to Morocco, and he he would pay children to have sex with him. Poor children, poor poor African children, children, and 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 he would take them to a, a cemetery and and he would sex, have sex with them in the cemetery, and 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 he developed the, the theory that um, the medical establishment had uh, nothing. I mean, he had developed. A sort of narrative in order to control people, people's lives, people like himself, who who also ended up in a in a mental institutions institution at some point, and he took this to such an extreme that he criticized 
the message given by the medical community to the homosexual community to use um, you know, protection when they had sex in order to prevent the spread of uh, AIDS. And he said this was just another form of exerting power over them and discriminating against them. And he died of AIDS in the end. Mm. Uh, so, so, so this is completely irrational. This is, this is completely insane. And this is the same philosophy that you are seeing uh, right now um, advancing at schools and uh, media and other parts, sexualizing minors not only in the US, also not in America and Europe. Uh, and Europe has a very dark past with this. Like Germany would have in the 70s experiments with children where the parents, and this is insane, like, you know, when people say, what are the parents thinking? Like they're not thinking. Well, it was the same in the 60s and 70s in Germany. They would have kindergartens where they would, uh, and these were all educated people coming out from universities. I mean, only people coming out from universities would do something like this, I, I think, uh, where they would sexualize children and bring them to have sex between them and also with adults. And they would question if the if it was a good idea to have sex with their own children. Because, you know, I mean, that was the point of, 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 of lunacy of this whole ideology, because once you get rid of the objective standards, objective truth of anything, or, or, or as a concept, what is the limit, right? If sexuality is nothing but a convention, why can't you have chill, uh, sex with your own children? It's like, who created this convention? Ah, is the bourgeois society, the white uh, straight men who, who want to criminalize and marginalize the rest of people who are not like them. That's the concept. And, mm. and they would, they even signed a letter, Michel Foucault, Simone de Beauvoir, who is the mother of all feminists, right? And, and, and from the whole queer movement today, even, defending pedophiles that were arrested in France in 1977 for having had uh, sex with children. And they signed a letter, all of these French intellectuals, dozens of them, uh, all of them rock stars at the time, defending these people and claiming or arguing for the abolishment of, um, of, of uh, consenting laws. Uh, of the you know uh, laws demanding that you know you have to be seventeen or or eighteen or whatever in order to have uh, sex with someone, and, and this is gaining traction again. It's insane. Yeah. What are what are like with with regard? We've talked a lot about the issues, and I think you know shedding light on these subjects because it can't exist in darkness if more people are talking about this. I mean, you're talking a lot about it with your research, with your book, with economics specifically with regards to the book, but is the solution to then just continue to talk about this, bring this to light, be vocal about it. And, and I would say be as vocal and active uh, as the, the social activists are. There, there's got to be a way to combat this, and it has to be with doing things vocally, enacting legislation, um, running for office, like all the things that we can do. What, what are some of those suggestions that you would have? I mean, this is a battle of ideas, and it's a battle for the minds and hearts of people. And 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 I, I strongly recommend, if if the uh, you know viewers of the, of your show have the have the time, um, to read Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci was the founder of the Communist Italian Party, uh, in the nineteen twenties, and he was the most little little uh, Marxist intellectual in the 20th century. And he said that what you had to do was to take over institutions, to take over schools, churches, and universities, and media, and so on, because it was not about the violent revolution. Against Lenin and Marx, he argued, it's not so much about the violent revolution. It's about changing people, the, how people think, their minds. And, and that you can achieve if you engage in what he called cultural hegemony. And you create a discourse that is so um, dominant in the public and private sphere even that convinces so many people that capitalism is wrong and that you know the institutions, the bourgeois institutions have to be overthrown, that the system will collapse by itself once you destroy their uh, its legitimacy in people's minds 
And, and that's exactly what they did with the long march through the institutions. And they took over universities. And I think that's the, the, the origin of the crisis, that we lost the universities and they are now controlled by, uh, you know, bureaucrats and professors who have uh, these totalitarian tendencies. And then you go to Harvard or Stanford or whatever, and then you, you go to other positions of influence in the media and Disney companies, and then the, the 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 effect, the influence of these ideas go far beyond the Department of Humanities at the universities and, and, and sciences. Now everyone is forced to take some training, microaggression training courses at Stanford, for instance. This is insane, uh, and, and it becomes. And this is uh, this is very important. It becomes part of the uh, um, general culture at some point, because the humanities, you know, tend to be relatively useless if you want to get a job and you have a degree in philosophy or literature or whatever. It's not very good if you have that. It's better to have engineering an engineering degree. But the 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 the, the fact is that the humanities define the soul of a nation all the questions about morality what is wrong and what is right are not scientific questions these are philosophical questions and 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 a culture reinforces the answers to these questions through movies through literature through philosophical books uh, entertainment music entertainment music all of that and and, and but you Art. need this Art, of course, you need the group of people who are thinking about these issues, who are mostly at universities, not only, but mostly at universities, to give credit to these ideas and to develop these ideas. And the West is basically um, a philosophical achievement. The idea of the individual, which which emerged from Christianity, yeah, that we, we deserve equal rights, uh, which is in the, in the Declaration of Independence in the United States. This is what made this uh, civilization so prosperous. And, and so when you lose the, the humanities, uh, you lose the, the fight, you lose the battle because, because you lose the, the case for, um, for, for what you consider is good, for what we view as, as good and what we consider evil becomes what most people or a lot of people consider, uh, consider appropriate. It's, that's why I think it's so dangerous when you when you start saying, "Oh, Shakespeare, he was just a representative of the bourgeois class and the white uh, heterosexual oppression of uh, everyone else," which is what, by the way, are teaching you at many universities, uh, so they can tell you, you know, any, you know, African American writer or Indian or Latino writer is as good as Shakespeare. There is no hierarchy; it's all a social construction. Yeah, to make you feel more inclusive. Uh, okay, everyone can be like Shakespeare. It's not true. Shakespeare is superior to everyone else. But you cannot make that claim if you don't believe there is a truth, an objective standard mm. for measurement, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the problem uh, with universities. And I would encourage everyone who is giving money to universities. And I've, I've, I recently talked to one who is a big donor at one of the Ivy League schools. I told him, don't give them more money. I mean, why do they continue supporting the destruction of of the United States and the American? You know, uh, they called it an experiment, but it's a very successful one, and it's it's now being attacked from 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 everywhere. Like uh, you have also the rivalry with China, you have Russia, you have. But the main problem is inside. It's a, it's the people trying to undermine it from the inside. And the Colin Kaepernick's of the world, and all of, all of these guys who who would claim that the flag represents something immoral, and which is, I mean, so it's so it's it's lunacy. It's so ironic, and an individual like that who's been the recipient and beneficiary of this amazing, incredible social experiment would basically spit and stomp all over the very thing that allowed him to progress the way that he has. Yeah, and and as I again, I mean, he's a uh, you know a, a sports person. He's very famous, but where did he uh, get these ideas? 
because Martin Luther King didn't think like that. He was very much an admirer of the founding fathers and he was claiming, you know, the promises they made in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, they have not been fulfilled for everyone. So let, let's move forward with this. But they would say, like Frederick Douglass, they would claim and argue that, uh, you know, that these were great ideas. <laughs> but Colin Kaepernick comes now and say, and says, no, you know, this is an oppressive system. This is horrible. The flag is uh, represents, uh, you know, oppression and slavery. This is complete, completely absurd, and it's it is completely against what Luther King and Frederick Douglass, who actually did something for black people in the United States, right, uh, would argue. I mean, they would be happy to see the huge progress that ha uh, has been made. Uh, over the last century in this country, even over the last decades. And there is no society with more freedom and more respect for individual rights, I think, than the United States and more diverse at the same time. And so um, I think it's very, um, I mean, sometimes I get a little angry because I, I grew up in Latin America. I know what failed nations look like. And I travel all, all over Latin America you know, uh, giving conferences and lectures and also Europe. But uh, I mean, the United States is the place everyone wants to go. Why? Why is that? <laughs> and and uh, and it's not because it's evil. It's because you have better opportunities in a but and it's a, it is a better place than the rest of the world. That's a reality. And I'm not even an American. I'm saying that because I know it's true. Right. Um, the city upon a hill when John Winthrop came with, with the settlers here to it, it is a city up on a hill and we all admire uh, the United States and we and if we lose the United States we will not even have a reference point for the rest of the world mm. and that will be a new age of darkness a horrible one because I don't think we can solve the, the vacuum with China or Russia or India or you know in Switzerland it's too small for that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Axel, I, I appreciate all of your efforts and all of your work and your conversation with me today. I mean, all of this is so enlightening. I actually expected the conversation would take a different track, um, talking more specifically about economics, but I'm really glad that we went down this, this route because such needed conversations um, and guys can always go pick up a copy of the book and read the book yeah. on their own, you know, so, which I would highly suggest they do. And you talk about it being uh, a pinnacle component of the, the entire conversation that we're having here. Why don't you let the guys know as we wind things down, where to go, where to connect with you, where to learn more about what you're up to. And of course, pick up a copy of the book as well. Yes. So the book is on Amazon and it has been recommended by some of the best economists in the United States. So I'm very happy. Um, like Deidre McCloskey, Casey Mulligan, Chicago University and many others. And uh, they, they can buy it there. And also at the website of Republic Books, they can find it. Um, and, uh, I have uh, an Instagram, which is at Axel Kaiser B. Um, uh, it's Kaiser with like Kaiser Permanente. It's the same, the same spelling and Axel with E not with, like Axel Rose. It's, it's, yeah. it has, a, yeah, it doesn't have any, it's a Axel with E and, and B from Barrent, which is my second last name. And also at Twitter, I am at Axel Kaiser. And so they can follow me on, on social media and, and, and yeah, and I'd be happy if they make some comments about the book there. Awesome. Well, we'll sync everything up again. Appreciate your work and all the, all the efforts you're putting forth. Hopefully this gets into some ears that need to hear it and we can start to uh, turn the tide, so to speak. I appreciate you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Ryan. Till next time.